The following program will make you want to grow things and experience new and wonderful dreams about your plants, garden, and garden design. Listener participation is always strongly advised. And welcome to you down the garden path with your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101. To get on board, send us an email right now. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. Ladies and gentlemen, right to your host of Down the Garden Path, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. Welcome everyone to this episode of Down the Garden Path, where each week we discuss down-to-earth tips and advice for your plants, gardens, and landscapes. As landscape designers and gardeners, we think it is important and possible to have great gardens that are low maintenance, and we want to help you make it happen. I'm Joanne Shaw, landscape designer and owner of Down to Earth Landscape Design. I have been designing beautiful gardens for homeowners east of Toronto for over a decade. With me is my co-host, Matthew Dressing. Welcome, Matthew. Welcome, Joanne. Good evening, everyone. I am Matthew Dressing, horticulturist and landscape designer and owner of Natural Affinity Designs. Natural Affinity is a landscape design and garden maintenance firm servicing Toronto and the Eastern GTA. Joanne and I enjoy hosting Down the Garden Path each week to bring you interesting, relevant, and helpful topics to help to help you achieve a great garden. We learn right along with you from each other, from our research, and from the guests that join us here on the show. As always, we welcome your questions via social media, emails, or phone calls. That's right. And we want to thank you for joining us on the live version of Down the Garden Path. And you can always check out past shows of Down the Garden Path on your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to be notified of new content. And please like, share, and leave us a comment. Hello, Matthew. Good evening, Joanne. How are you? (laughs) I'm good, thank you. I'm hot. It's hot out. (laughs) It is. It is. Did you work today? I did. Yep. I did work today out in the sun at the garden center. Beautiful, beautiful. Nursery is finally picking up. We had phenomenal sales last week. So everyone's getting out and buying some shrubs and trees. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty good. Still trending. Lots and lots of fruit trees are going out. Uh, Veggies, uh, anything flowering really at the moment. Yes. Yeah. When it's in flower, right? Because it's in flower. So people are buying it. Yes, and even they're seeing like things, for example, the Chanticleer pears right now out on the streets, they're in flower and ours, because they're smaller containers, they they flowered, but they're not blooming as long as the ones that are all big and mature and established, but they're still coming in and they're like, oh, is that the Chanticleer? Oh, I need one of those or I, this one's starting to bloom. Where do I get this? So, yeah, if you see it out there, there's lots of stock to be picked yeah. up. So, oh, yeah, lots of fun. Good. That is good. And stock inventory and everything coming in? Yeah, still some delays still with some things, but, you know, things like dwarf Japanese maples and topiaries. I think we've got a little bit of it, but there's still there's still shipments to come. So, yeah, lots of fun stuff yet to arrive. Okay, okay. Yeah. And what kind of questions are you getting at the garden center this time of year? You know what? It's a lot of uh, there's a lot of novice, brand new gardeners. Yeah, you were saying that. Yeah. yeah. So 
a lot of it is like they aren't even sure of how to plant or how to dig a hole or what fertilizer or what soil. So a lot of, of good beginner kind of basic questions, but it's good because there are a lot of excited new gardeners that are willing to try everything and spend the time at home to, you know, make that beautiful oasis. So. Yeah. Uh, it's too bad you can't hand them our uh, our uh, podcast, uh, right? We've given we've so much information for beginners over the last four years. It's such a shame we can't like sneak them out. Go listen to this podcast, you know. We'll have to do that. We'll have to make like a little business card that yeah. can carry. It. You know, I've got a lot of answers to that. I recommend yes. it here. Tune yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah, so a new project for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So, well, I just think I don't know how uh, we can easily do the card, but I just don't know if it's ethical for you to <laughs> to do that. But uh, uh, anyway, so that's good to know. It's good to know. And is everybody still behaving and physical distancing? How yeah, is that? For, for the most part, everyone's still distancing. Everyone's uh, trying to be aware, and it, uh, we have buttons that say, you know. Uh, six feet or two meters and we are just as staff will just back up we'll just pull away from them and oh, oh, oh sorry yeah sorry sorry so lots of still people can I bring you my phone and they try to hand it and it's like no I'm not touching your phone and I can't let's go inside or email me the picture I'm happy to write you back but yeah 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 so lots of people still looking for designs as well excellent a lot of design business out there to be had yet so okay yeah. well that's good and uh yeah that's interesting so the yeah yeah i've been pretty steady i mean i'm trying to get caught up so i've had to kind of delay some some appointments for the next Ooh. uh for next week um well i see some thursday and uh and then the following week so yeah um so it's been good you know, I think it's just one of those things. I think when now that people are knowing they're going to be close to home, they want to make some improvements and do some stuff that they, you know, maybe weren't planning on, uh, you know, right away. Do it a little yes. sooner. The the one design, probably the biggest design question besides, you know, I need a design done. Um, how do I do that? Is everyone's coming in now that they're at home. They're trying to fill that two foot tiny little space right that the builders left beside their garden or they pave their entire backyard because they have a pool or they want low maintenance and they need a tree to live in like a three by three little thing buried and surrounded by stone and it's like no yeah, can <laughs> like, help, yeah. I, i've got like three things for you you're not going to get that shade tree in there for sure yeah and yeah, yeah you can have shade in 10 years yeah yeah right <laughs> Yeah, I love it when the landscapers leave that much room for a tree, you know, okay. not thinking about the root, like how big a root ball is for a big tree. Exactly. So I, I think it just, it underlines, and I, I keep saying to people about, you know, our low maintenance talk we talked about last year, taking your garden to the next level, you know, just planning and designing and realizing that low maintenance, you know, you, you, you need that extra space right? To have the plants fill that space and to do what they need to do. And it's lower maintenance to give them the proper space in right from the beginning. That's right. So, That's right. You know, talk to your landscapers if you're getting something done. Yeah. Some hardscaping done. Yeah. And, and it just goes back to my little tagline of the great landscapes really do start with a plan. Yes, because, I tried to lead you into that. Yeah, thank you. Because, <laughs> you know, it, it, you, you need to plan for it. You need to plan for future growth. You need to plan for the right and amount of space for something. You, you really know, do. It really does take um, some forethought. And sometimes even the best designers, I think um, your own space, you know, the most creative people, the most better, like, the, the, you know, really good gardeners. But because it's your own space, you're too close to it. Yes. You know, and you, you know all the options. So it's really hard you need someone to kind of walk in and with a fresh perspective. So I know we did that talk a couple right at the beginning of May. So check out that one creating low maintenance gardens, but we are June 1st. This is a new month. <gasps> Can you believe it? I can't believe it's June already. I know. But with a new month, as our listeners know, comes a new topic here on down the garden path. And this month we are going to talk all about perennials. So from caring for your perennials and new perennials for 2020 uh, to peonies and ornamental grasses, uh, this month we'll have you growing back for more. So tonight we're going to begin our month-long perennial discussion 
with an intro to perennials, their care, and what's new in the perennial world for 2020. Excellent. So if you want to join the conversation, or maybe you're a new listener, um, or you have a question about perennials that you have, or you're looking for some new perennial suggestions, Joanne and I would love to talk to you and ha have you write us here in the studio or at home over Zoom. And uh, you can write us at instudio101 at gmail.com. That's so. right. We'd love to hear from you, especially if you have some perennial questions or uh, if you have a favorite perennial, we'd love to hear. We're going to talk about our favorite perennials as yeah. part of the show, but we would love to hear what your favorite is, why it's your favorite. Um, yeah, we would love that, wouldn't we? We would. And tell us where you're from, because maybe mm -hmm. you have a perennial that is we can't grow up here in the gta area of ontario canada so you know share some excitement maybe you have a really cool perennial we've never heard of We'd that's love to right that too that's right that's right yeah ones that aren't too hardy for us we yeah. would love that for sure so what do you want to start with just the basic uh definition of perennial i know people often get annuals and perennials mixed up that's right Yes, so annuals and perennials. Um, let's get really scientific like I like to do. <laughs> so annual- Oh, you're going into the zone, are you? Okay, let's go. Let's go into the zone. So annual comes from the Latin annum, meaning year. So annuals, a year, a year, annum. So perennial, the word meaning is two words, annum and per, per meaning through, and annum, annual. So through the years, and you should see Joanne's face right now on Zoom right now. She's just laughing at me. So just think per, you know, perforate going through something through the years. And that's the word perennials. So perennials are something that's going to come back, survive your lowest temperatures in your region and return every year and grow a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, and, and hopefully bloom a little bit longer and more for you. So annuals versus perennials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. So I'll stop it there because you're ready to laugh. <laughs> No, 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 it's fine. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that, that, and you know, that is something that people don't know. Cause when you think annual people, I think sometimes think come up annually. Right. Right. And that's where they get it. Right. You know, so they're thinking, so they'll say, you know, I, I just want annual. It's like, I want it to come back every year. And it's like, no, then you want perennials, <laughs> you know? So, True, so yeah. yeah. So I think, it, I think there are a lot of novice gardeners out there and I think it can be intimidating just the language, you know, the difference between, you know, th never mind the whole botanical language, botanical names, right? Yes. Or, or the fact that many plants have two names, some of them botanical, some several common names. So I think, I think gardening, you know, for novice new people, it can seem a little daunting. Most certainly. Most certainly. I definitely agree. And woody shrubs and trees, because I get this question as well, and I've, I've had it a number of times this week alone, um, they are also perennials. The things that leave wood back, they will come back every year as well. Mm -hmm. So there's there's the perennials, the herbaceous perennials, they die to the ground. And then there are the woody perennials that leave wood behind, uh, and but they will come back as well. And yes. if you love trees and shrubs, because I know, Joanne, you are a huge tree and shrub fan, uh, a sneak peek, that's what we're going to dive deep dive into next month is uh, some shrubs. All right. That's Joanne's right. waving her July. hand. Hi. <laughs> Woohoo. Deep dive in July. Um, right. So yeah, so that is good. And so this time of year, do we want to talk about how you, the thing about perennials is do we really need to do anything special? Uh, not overly. Uh, no, I mean, they're the ones that there's, there's some exceptions always to the rule, right? There's things like Vernera, um, a lovely shade perennial. Uh, or partial shade perennial, big heart-shaped leaves, silver and white. They're a nice hosta substitute, um, but they can be weird. You always get that thing where they like to be divided with every within every five to six years, or else they kind of tend to go root bound and they choke out and die. So there's all those weird exceptions, but no, not really. I mean, much like we'll talk about with the trees and shrubs, basically just you know finding the sun that you need right? Buying the right plant for the right place. Right. Right. Knowing what soil you have. There's going to be some that are going to adapt to the drier soils, sandier soils. There's going to be some that do the clay soils. There's going to be some that prefer more of the moist soils or evenly moist soils. 
right? You know, you're a stilbes versus your echinaceas type thing. So just making sure that you've got the right plant in the right place, the right sun for the right plant and the right soil for the right plant as well. Outside of that, they're going to die back. So there is a little bit of a cleaning, whereas, you know, the shrubs, they'll lose their leaves and they just kind of sit there. Um, the other ones will die back. And then sometimes you do have to kind of clean them up and uh, take them away. Oh. Um, yeah, you'll cut them like, for... by cutting them back. And we've talked about this in the show, too, where historically people have felt like they needed to put their garden to bed in the winter. And that's when a lot of stuff is cut back and everything's right. kind of kept clean. And how in the last couple of years has been a little bit more of a movement to not cutting back, right, to leaving. Um, so, you know, I think of like purple cone flowers, some of the ornamental grasses, like any of the flowers that have kind of seed heads, just leaving them alone. And yeah, they start to look dried and unsightly, but that birds and birds will eat those seeds and insects will, you know, burrow in those stems, that type of thing. So, so, you know, and I, although I think there are some perennials, like think of a hosta that once the frost hits it, those leaves go mushy and it's done. Like it, you're not going to really see evidence of it, right? There are some of those perennials, right? That once, once winter, even though we're not officially quote unquote cleaning up, you're really not going to see that much of a trace, but then there are other perennials that there really is a substantial, still kind of a, I don't want to say a skeleton. That seems like a negative word, but. <laughs> but yeah, some of that part, like a, a woody shrub is left behind, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's things that are there and you're right. There's lots of beneficial insects, things like cucaras, your coral bells. They prefer to have their leaves left on them because if you look, their tubers, their stems kind of grow up. Uh, and become elongated. They like those heads to be kind of covered with their leaves as they fall and add extra insulation and winter protection as well. Mm. So definitely, and we talked about it lots of times on the show too, right? Leaving things because there's definitely a benefit to keeping them overwintered and all the insects and protecting. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. You sent me that text and threw me totally off. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I That's really okay. didn't mean to do that. Do you know what that plant is? Um, I will have, no, I don't off the top of my head. Okay. I will have to look is, it up. Is it a plant or a weed? Someone sent me a message asking. <laughs> oh, okay. Because it's everywhere. So I'm wondering if it is a native something, something. It could be. So we'll have to find that out. Or maybe we can post it to the, uh, <laughs> yeah, down the garden yeah. path Facebook. And she, so she tried the same person, uh, emailed me some questions last week. Monday during the show and she's like oh my gosh I, so, I did it again I'm so sorry it's Monday <laughs> so anyway I can get back to her after the show but yes I mean if you have questions if you have pictures for us we would love them uh, in studio 101 at gmail.com right that's right and speaking of questions uh, we have two questions we have uh, Connie Stewart Connie Stewart a perfectly timed here uh, hi, Joanne and Matthew. Question, how often should we fertilize our perennials and what type of fertilizer should we use? And question. thank you. Yeah, that falls right into what we we're talking about, caring for our perennials. That's right. That's right. Um, I always like top dressing perennials with a nice compost. Um, just kind of, again, feeding that soil, giving them that longer sustained feed. If you would like, you can also go through, you know, there's granular fertilizers for perennials as well as water soluble fertilizers for perennials. I find that with healthy soil, uh, uh, leaving that compost on, giving them that nice feed and really working that, feeding that soil that's there, there's, there's usually a good enough fertilizer uh, to get them started in the spring and have them moving for a long time. If you feel that you need to more or you wanna do more, you can definitely feed regularly. Your granular fertilizers, um, there's gonna be two. You're gonna have kind of just your like your basic kind of fertilizer, like your 20, 20, 20, your 10, 15, 10. Those are good for when your perennials, like your hostas or your ferns or even flowering perennials like your echinaceas or your leucanthemums that just have foliage at the moment, right? They're just kind of growing, they're spreading, they're, they're more vegetative growth. You're gonna drive that with your more of your nitrogen. Uh, you can put them down in a granular form. You can sprinkle it out, um, you know, just kind of follow the instructions on them. There's a lot goes quite a ways. Um, that would be, to me, that's, that's a like, do it and forget about it, right? Like you would you do that, it. you would do that maybe once a season. Right. And you can right? do it like, 
usually they last anywhere from six to eight weeks. Yeah. So to and me, that's something, like, yeah, well, you do twice. that in June and then forget about it. But it's it's my least favorite option. The, is the granular one. Yeah. Yeah. And do you prefer the water soluble option? No, I, I think I'm with you. Is, I think the option. focus is, is improving the soil. I think that is mm -hmm. got to be where it's hard to do both. Um, I've never really fertilized my perennials. I know um, when I was fighting with my uh, macrophilia hydrangeas and couldn't get them to bloom, that's when I would fertilize that with, let's say, a high middle number yeah. or roses with a high middle number, you know, something that I really wanted to bloom. But I find that perennials, you know, they're just going to do, they just do their thing when they they're supposed do to their do their thing. thing. And that fertilizer really doesn't make a difference to it. Yeah. Yeah. You and know? if you've got, you know, good soil, the right plant, the right place for their conditions, they know what to do. They're genetically yeah. programmed. That's how they've evolved to do their thing. Yeah. We tend to break the cycle with, you know, the natural compost and leaving litter and, and cutting things back. That's more detriment than really not feeding them. Yeah. Um, or, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So Connie, you could also go water soluble as well. It's, you know, the one you add to water, like your miracle grow kind of thing. And you water that every two weeks. Um, but again, the difference really is just like Joanne, you were saying too, right? Like the blooming fertilizer. So if it's green, kind of go more for a balanced, basic kind of fertilizer. When it's time for them to flower, switch to something with a higher uh, middle number of phosphorus. And you can go all the way out and keep going that way. Mm -hmm. Just basically every two weeks, you're going to do either one with the water, water soluble. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, and Connie, you can do that if you've got uh, flowering baskets, like you're right. The same, it's yeah. basically the same fertilizer. It's the same so fertilizer. If it is something you feel like your, your perennials need that, need that extra fertilizing, <laughs> then you, you know, whatever you're putting on your annuals uh, to fertilize them, you can also put on your perennials. But I really, um, yeah, I think it, it, for, for our low maintenance thoughts, uh, I would say, um, not to worry, Connie. Yeah, yeah, focus on building the soil and they'll all be really nice and happy. That's right. And, sure. and, and the position, like making sure that this, like, because right. sometimes I think people think fertilizer, like something's not blooming and it needs, so it must need fertilizer, but yet something's not getting enough sun or something's getting too much sun. Right. So really understanding that. Right, there's other issues that are there. Yeah. yeah. Much yeah. like people, when we're under stress, we don't quite perform as well. Yes. Right. They were a little off our own game. Same with the perennials and things. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Donna has written in another question. Uh, Donna writes in, hi, listening to you from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Donna, the weather must be beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love your show. Uh, my favorite perennial is the garden phlox. Have you ever heard of it? Is it a beautiful plant? Oh, sorry. It is a beautiful plant uh, with a, with beautiful colors. Love it. Yes, Very nice. we can grow that here too. Yes, we are yes. lucky. Phlox uh, mm. paniculata. That's right. Um, they are, are beautiful and they're so long blooming in so many different colors. Um, I really love it. And so many new hybrids too, now that are becoming out on the market that are that mildew, powdery mildew resistant, mm -hmm. uh, which really kind of, they're so prone to that. So that's yeah. nice to see too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for sharing, Donna. We love hearing where you guys are from. That's and right, we do. Your favorite perennials. Do we have time for one more listener question? I think we do. <laughs> uh, oh, I need to scroll up a bit here. Uh, Grace, Grace writes in, hello down the garden path. My favorite perennial is asters. So beautiful. They add so much to a beautiful flower garden. Stay healthy. Thank you, Grace. Ah, very cool, Grace. Yes, I love that you enjoy the asters. That's probably one thing, Grace, I see uh, just for, with the garden center. So few asters anymore. Um, even in like the fall mums and things when the fall plants come out, um, even the perennial forms when they start to bloom, uh, very few people are after them or, or see them anymore until they're really in the bloom. Uh, one of my favorites is probably um, Peach's Pick. And I, I love that one. It kind of comes oh. out. It's nice and peachy. It's very nice and airy. It's almost like a, it reminds me of a, like a Japanese maple cut leaf, but like upside down. And then they come out in pinks and somewhat a little bit of a blue tone. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's funny because when I think of asters, I think of the purple one. 
yeah that purple like one yeah. that we always see in the fall yes. yeah, yeah 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 for sure yeah. for sure but it's true that is um you know we're i think we're planning on a show later in the season about how we extend our garden uh, but yeah, that is something that people think about, much like you were saying earlier in the show about the spring tree, the flowering trees. You know, when the people aren't looking for those trees in July, they're looking for them now when they're flowering. And yeah. same with asters, can kind of anything fall blooming, it's kind of the same thing. They don't think about them all year right. until they see some, them blooming in someone else's garden. That's right. That's you right. Know? So, uh, so that's great. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yes. Thank you very much, Grace. That's not, now, do you have some of your favorites? What are your favorites? Or what are my favorite perennials? Ooh. Um, the one that jumps to mind always for me is, is toad lily, the trichirdus. Oh, yes. Okay. I love the toad lilies. They're anywhere from two to three to four feet tall by the same wide. And they kind of have like a zigzagging uh, stem pattern. And they come out in the fall with these beautiful orchid-like uh, stems with these little star turned up little star flowers that look very much like a phalaenopsis orchid where they're kind of you know alternating or side by side down the, the arching stems that's one of them always one of my favorites and my favorite probably variety or cultivar is um, gilt edge uh, or thunderstruck because they've got this nice little yellowy variegation on the leaf so they actually have a little bit of color and some architectural uh, habit to them when the rest of the year when everybody else is doing their thing oh, okay that's one of my favorites one of your favorites what about you i think what first i'm going to back up and say what i consider a favorite mm. why i consider these my favorites is and i think it's because of what i do for a living right so if it if it only blooms for a week i can't yeah. have it because i may never see it you know and uh so i i tend so I tend to focus on long bloomers. So mm -hmm. with probably the exception of a peony, which we're going to talk about next week, you know, everybody should have a peony in their garden. And yes, it can only last a short period of time and it could rain and be done and, you know, that kind of thing. But aside from that, I, the favorites that come to mind are ones that bloom a long time. Yeah. So I'm going to say a perennial geranium, um, mm. Roseanne. I've heard there's a new and improved one called Azure Blue, which I have not used yet, but I have Roseanne in my garden. I probably put it in every garden I design. Um, <laughs> it can go a little like, it, you know, for a perennial, it's almost like it's a small shrub. Um, but I can honestly say with the exception of this year, because we had such cool weather, but every other year it, it has bloomed in May and it is still blooming in November. Yes. It, it doesn't require any love. It doesn't require staking. It doesn't require deadheading. It doesn't require fertilizing. It doesn't require anything. And uh, so, I mean, it, it can get mounding. It does need some space. It's not uh, invasive. Like it doesn't, you know, show up, pop up somewhere. Uh, it has, you know, beautiful purple flowers. It can handle full sun. It can handle part sun. Um, so, yeah. So I think that is one of my favorites. And nice. I just love that it can go that long. And I have to say, even cleanup. So once it falls, because it's kind of big and wide and, and kind of sprawly. Um, so I'd say, maybe, I don't know if it, maybe it gets a foot high. I don't think it's 18 inches high. Like it, it definitely mounds, right? Mm. And it is, so it's wider than it is high. Um, but then when it dies back, so in the spring, it kind of starts up again from the center of the ground. And then all those, all those, you know, last year's uh, flowers and leaves and stuff just become, it's almost like straw and it's just they, not there. Like, so it doesn't even require any cleanup in the spring. I love it. So that is my, I mean, I still have others, but that, that one I would say is one of my favorites. Yeah. It, that's such a great plant. Yeah. For sure. Most and people certainly. confuse them because it's a geranium, but this is a perennial geranium. Yes. It's not a uh, annual, pel how do you say that? Pelagoria? Yeah. Pelagorium, yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I said it right. Ooh. Oh, sorry, sorry. Pelagonium. Gonium, okay. Pelagonium. Yeah, Which yeah. is an annual geranium, but this is a perennial geranium. Right. So, um, so yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and geranium by, um, by genus, by actual, like, botanical name. The pelagoniums right. only have geranium as a common name. Right. Yeah. Yes. Ooh. We got sciencey again on everybody, but that's okay. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think that, um, I know I made some notes when we were talking about the show. Uh, I also love the Salvias, mm. uh, Caradonna being my favorite. So that That's one's a little favorite. bit, yeah. So that one, now that one does require, require a teeny bit of maintenance in that you do have to deadhead it. So, you know, they're kind of long. It stays nice and compact, like a nice size. It does get to be almost 18 inches to two feet, but, mm. you know, very stately, not floppy okay. or anything. There you go. Am I is it blurring out? Oh, you're there? kind of blurred out there for a second. Just when you were talking about being upright and compact. Oh, okay, yes, I'm using my hands and freaking the screen out. But uh, uh, they send up nice little purple spikes. So then once the, bl the blooms are done off those spikes, you can just, I cut them back to the first, first or second leaves, right? And mm -hmm. then they will re-bloom. So they still will bloom for me kind of June until the fall, but they do require that little bit of deadheading. Yeah. The other thing I love about Caradonna too, is even as the, the stems are growing uh, and they're not in bloom, they have that nice purple, perfectly square stem. So mm -hmm. even when you don't have flowers, when you kind of look at them at the right angle, um, when you're not like right on top of them, they have that nice purple kind of shading to the, to the stems as they get ready to bloom, which is really cool. Yeah, and the leaves are a little on the silvery side too, don't you find? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. no, they're yeah. quite nice. Um, another one I guess I have on my list, and I rarely see it here, and it's not a long bloomer like uh, like you have, but it's um, a spy, uh, spigelia, spigelia, so, or an Indian pink. Um, it's another shade plant. It's herbaceous perennial. It's zoned, okay. zoned for here. Um, they grow about one to two, sometimes three feet tall by uh, usually about half that. So about a foot and a half, two feet wide. But they've got like nice uh, oppositely held lanceolate leaves and they have upright arching stems and they fill their stems much like, um, and I'm going to totally blank on the name. I'm going to find it out, but I'll tell you later. Uh, but they're very upright held and they're big, long red trumpets like flowers. And they open with these little yellow stars. I can't, um, why can't I picture this? What is it again? A spigelia. So just for, cause you're probably gonna look it up. So it's S P I G E L I A. And it blooms all the month of June. Um, and I like it cause it's one of those just, again, it's, it's that partial to full shade and she has a nice bloom period. Uh, and a nice upright uh, habit and a really showy, unusual flower uh, for the shade. And oh, yeah. Red for, for shade and red in the shade is like, wow. Yeah. And that then it, really at the petals open, the inside of those trumpet shaped flowers are all bright yellow. So that's. that's Honestly, goodness, Matt, one. I have never seen this plant before. And this is hardy <laughs> to our zone. Like it is. It's a zone five. Wow. So zone five to nine. Is it a native? It, it is. It's a North American and like Eastern North American native. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's huh. a fun one. And well, there's everybody, a... you have to check these out. This is really interesting. Does the garden center where you work carry them? You know what? They don't because I don't order perennials. <laughs> 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 or they would. <laughs> yes, for sure. Well, I'll have to look at that. I honestly have never seen that before. But yeah. that is very interesting because it is hard to find color for shade. Yes, and that's one of the things that, and again, because it's a shade, I, I was drawn to it because it was that shade. And then it was just so striking, that red, mm -hmm. to be in the shade. And I love the two-tone. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah that it almost reminds of me of the for fuchsia, the annual fuchsia, but upside down. <laughs> Yes, yes, the annual yeah. very long tubular one. That yes, that one has tubulars the... hanging. This one kind of has upright tubers. Yeah, so that's interesting, Matt. Yeah, so that's one of my other favorites as well. Okay. Um, what time? Oh, yeah. Do we want to talk about some more of our favorites, or do we sure. want to talk well, about I, some others? Well, I this is kind of a new favorite to me. Yeah. Well, no, I mean I've always known about it. Is the classic Monarda or Bee Bomb. Mm, um, yes. But, you know, they get mildew, they get big, they spread, they're a little bit invasive. Um, and yes, they attract, you know, lots of pollinators. But lately, in the last couple of years, there have really been some improvements and shorter ones. Yes. So cherry bomb, you know, so I, I did put some in my garden last year. And I think because of that color, like you can't, there's not a lot of perennials that have that color. 
No. Um, you know, a lot, I do that, right? All my, all my favorites are blue and, and everybody loves blue, but you need something else sometimes. So, um, so yeah, so I would say the one I'm starting to use a little bit more of, and they come and go, don't you think? Like I've had favorites and then I'm like done with them. I need something new. Yeah. Well, um, certainly. Yeah. So I'm, I think I'm loving the red and the fuchsias of the Monarda, but having it be something small. So something more, uh, you know, a foot tall, 18 inches tall, uh, that type of thing. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Monardas are fantastic. And you're right. There's a lot of whole new, uh, I think that one of them is the bubblegum series or something yes. these bright pinks and they're all like a foot to a foot and a half at most, if not smaller. And they're just so bright and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. So that was a couple of our favorites. What else would you like to talk about? I know perennials is such a big topic, but yet it's, it's kind of like, how, how can we best help our listeners? That's right. Well, one of the things I think we were talking about too is um, we have the 2020 every year. The garden industry always comes out with all those brand new cultivars. Um, so I don't know if everybody has seen all those lists. I know as designers and garden center people, we're always after the um, newer introductions uh, of the year. So we could we could talk about some of those. Yeah, then, absolutely. I I don't think I know what the perennial of the year is or what that what the new ones for perennials are. I know okay. the shrubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let us go to let's start with some of the uh, perennials of the year. So if we don't know, um, the official color of the year for 2020 is uh, Pantone's classic blue. So just Ooh. a Pantone blue. Uh, which is nice. The Haas of the year um, is Dancing Queen. Speaking of, of perennials. Okay. Uh, so she's, you know, 18 inches tall uh, by about uh, 25 to 28 inches wide, zones two to nine, and for the nice upright, a sturdy mound with pie crushed uh, wrinkled edges on the leaf hmm. and most, okay. most flowers in mid summer. So that's our Hossa of the year. Uh, there's two perennials of the year. I think one is by the Perennial Association and then the other one's the Proven Winners Perennial of the Year. Okay. So uh, the Perennial Association of the Year, Perennial of the Year is the Sun King Aurelia. So the... So I think of that as a shrub. Yes. And I also think of that as a shrub. So it's, okay. and it's kind of like... I, I kind of group it together with your butterfly bush, your caryopteris, and then like oh. this group where they're kind of that quick growing, semi woody, soft, like first year kind of wood that uh, has a really good chance of like dying almost down to the ground kind of thing every year. But that's supposedly the, the perennial uh, of the year okay. for, for the Sun King Aurelia. Beautiful, uh, nice bright golden leaves. Uh, white flowers later in the year. D now, does it flower? I did not. That's why I think I thought it was a shrub. I did not think it flowered. I thought it was just uh, more of a foliage because it actually, even though it's called Sun King and it is a chartreuse, it is a shade plant. It is, exactly. So she does prefer partial uh, sun to keep a lot of that yellow. And then okay. she will take the tall, the shade, but the innermost leaves tend to start to fade into that a little bit more green. And okay. then it's a little bit more stronger on the outer edges uh, or most of the part. So you can see some of a lot of, if you Google it, like the pictures have very chartreuse everywhere. And if you look really inside it, she starts to go a little bit kind of green okay. uh, as she gets darker into the shade. Yeah. But yeah, definitely. Zone three to nine, a nice mounding habit. Uh, but yeah, she gets uh, uh, two foot flower spikes in midsummer, followed by inedible purple berries and uh Ooh, is a nice yeah, shade cool. plant especially if you have deer issues oh yes okay. they're very deer resistant deer resistant that's good to know you okay protect some hostas and what does the perennial of the year for uh proven winners one of my things that were on my list as well um i don't know if you like them but the russian sages mm -hmm. so denim and lace Mm -hmm. uh russian sage or, or per perovskia or i always say proboskia i switched the v uh, <laughs> but that's the perennial of the year 
So the Russian sages, she's going to grow about 32 to 38 tall and wide, full to part sun, zones four through nine, and then just long lasting compact uh, purple blue flowers all the way from midsummer through midfall. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one is very salt and deer resistant as well. Okay. So that's our perennials of the year. Uh, yeah, I would say it's one of my favorites. I do have it in my garden. My critique of it, and I don't know about denim and lace, um, but my critique of the plant is just that it's not as upright as I'd like it to be. I, I you know, it is a little like scraggly, like I, you know, you see the picture of it and you, you see the spot for it and you just want it to be linear and you want it to just be like an ornamental grass and just grow straight up. But I find it, the branches kind of go a little wonky and it, it, um, yeah. I yeah. find that especially of like the just the straight Russian sage. Okay. The 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 big tall ones. Yeah, they yes. get up so big and then they just start to almost like split like a sedum that needs dividing. How yeah. cracks in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then it does. It looks very wild and open and weird looking. Yeah. yeah so I I have the dwarf I don't remember the name of the dwarf ones, but I do have the what I would consider the shorter version because mm -hmm. I knew not to buy the big one. Um and they're still doing it and they're still doing it yeah yeah, so. yeah for sure i think some of it is you maybe they're reaching a little bit for the sun but I, I think they get a plenty of sun where they are so uh so yeah so that's my only thing but they certainly yeah. do um you could even cut them and bring them in the house you know like yeah. they are uh you know it's like it's it's it, it is a sage i mean it, it does the it, there is some fragrance to the foliage and things like that so uh so yeah it's a uh, it's a word one and one that similar color that I also love that is by far the best I mean we're talking about me again the best <laughs> pollinator in my garden is actually cat mint or nepeta yes um, that one it has been blooming for about a couple weeks now despite the cool start it has been blooming and uh, I like walkers low which stays lower not super low but lower <laughs> And it also will bloom, you know, mid-May right until November. And the bees and butterflies love it. And it does not attract cats. It's not cat mint. Nip. <laughs> it is cat yes. mint. Right? Mint, not nip. That's yes. correct. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect segue to one of our brand new perennials uh, introductions for 2020. We have uh, cat mint, the ver cultivar blue prelude. Ooh, uh, okay. So that's a, who's whose favorite is that? Uh, I don't know. Is it yours? No, oh, no, oh, this is. Said... I'm not sure who introduced it. I'm okay. not too sure who introduced it. It looked. Um, I threw you I, off. Sorry. Go ahead. No, Cat no, Mint. that's okay. What is it called? Blue. Blue Prelude. Um, I don't think it's a proven winners. Okay. Um, it might be a first editions or. Um, there's what's the other garden center? I forget what its name is, but. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, oh. And this by Gelia, sorry, because I was going to try to remind the name. For those who didn't look it up, it has the flowers that remind me of Crocosmia. Mm -hmm. So those big grass-like blades, the big arch in red and oranges. That's what it looked like. It's yes. Crocosmia. Yeah, so Blue Prelude. Um, it's actually a, a very tall, upright, well, not very tall, but it's a, an upright uh, with soft green leaves, only growing about two to three feet tall and three feet wide, uh, full part sun. But it has larger flowers than Walker's Low. And it's a nice yeah. true blue with the same long uh, mid May through September kind of bloom period. Okay. Yeah. And that's yeah. for those who might be listening, it's hardy to zone five through nine. And so, yeah. I can I can also vouch for its uh, a salt, to salt tolerance because I have it on my uh, health strip that is nice. my along my curb that uh, kind of I'm on a I don't have a sidewalk so my garden goes right to the curb and the snow and the city salt and all that stuff uh, so that's I found when I found I put I put it in one place and found how great it did so then I've kind of put it in a few clumps because it just covers the space and it's and it you know who can beat the blooming and then if it can survive the winter in those harsh conditions then you know then it's worth keeping in my garden oh yeah for sure Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. Yeah, so that is good. Uh, a few more. Should we continue with some new introductions? Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And are there any questions? Are our listeners tuning in or listening? Let's take a look because I honestly, I had that up for another thing up. We do. Let's take some listener questions. Sure. 
Uh, thank you for everyone who sent some questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to you sooner. Um, but Irene writes in, love a stilby as my favorite perennial mm -hmm. plant. Uh, I live in Washington, D.C. Thanks for your show. Love the information, Irene. Thank you, Irene. Thank um, you. One of my favorite, I if I were a, per, a plant, I would honestly, I'd be a shade plant. Um, I love being <laughs> I'm getting that sun. hint, yeah. Right? <laughs> but I just think back to another one of my favorite perennials is the Color Flash series of astilbes. And they still have those, the nice, thick, um, bright, upright heads. Uh, that all the stillies really get and I kind of imme immediately think of the vision series but I like the color flash because they get that rich red like almost like Japanese blood grass burning bush kind of foliage as, as she gets older and and the fall approaches so I love that that extra leaf and it also has more of a rounded leaf than the like a broader kind of segmented looking leaf so so it's also your favorite in addition to being irene's favorite <laughs> right right yeah well the color flash i don't know what ones that irene has maybe she has uh the visions in red but um i love the color flash series that's my favorite group of the stillbies so thank you irene uh joanne writes in hi joanne and matthew what a fantastic topic tonight i am so sorry to finally get out of um Oh, so happy, sorry, uh, to finally get out in the garden here in Erie, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. My favorite perennial plant is Russian sage. Are you familiar with it? So beautiful. Please stay healthy. So I'm sorry, Joanne, I didn't get to your um, your question right away. Uh, but yes, did you hear? I hope you heard our, our uh, talk about our yeah. Russian sages. And um, I'm glad you really enjoy that one too. You'll have to maybe try the uh, denim and lace one and let us. That's know right. Try that denim and lace one and let us know what you think. That's I right. didn't write that down either. Sorry, I meant to denim and lace. Yeah, I love the name. I love. Don't you love the names? I I do. Love what a job those. to be able to name these things. Could you imagine? <laughs> yeah, I know there's a daylily named Matt. It's an orange, taller daylily, but I've never. I haven't found it. I don't know oh. if there's a Joanna out there. I don't know. But who knows? So Joyce writes in as well. Hi, no questions tonight. Uh, but my favorite perennial is daylily. Thank you from Atlanta, Georgia. Thank, Thank you, Joyce. You, Joyce. Yeah. There you go. So, uh, yeah, daylilies. Um, do you have a favorite daylily? No. No. <laughs> Well, I, I would have over you. I mean, I early in my career, I was uh, st uh, it was on the Stella Doro bandwagon and and kind of overused them and and clients loved them initially, but then they came became kind of like the green and white hosta, where you know shortly you had too much of it and then nobody wanted it, and yeah. then when you saw it also growing in parking lot gardens, that it was like oh, I don't know if I want that in my garden too. So. Uh, you know, there are people who, who like daylilies and that's fine. A lot of existing gardens that I kind of refurb because uh, it, does, it does qualify as something that blooms a long time. Yes. So it's worth keeping and uh, and it comes up pretty early in the spring. So you got something there, right? Yeah, definitely. Those late starters can be annoying. So usually I recommend that they move them or divide them and kind of relocate them in, in a few different areas. Um, but they usually like to keep them. So yeah, so no, I, I have to say, I, I'm not overly, uh, overly, I think I want more flowers. Right, right, yeah. I like the, the spider type uh, daylilies just because they have that, not that classic kind of uh, diploid kind of curly, typical daylily looking flower. And then I wish I could find, and I think it's just not hardy to our zone, uh, but peach doro. Um, oh, so okay. Yeah, because there's yellow, red, purple, and yeah. um, the peach. Yeah. But I never ever see peach, uh, so it's it's just a nice, soft kind of peachy pink, which is really yeah. cute. Yeah, well, that's good. Uh, Ken writes in. Oh, are you ready? Okay. Oh. No, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, <laughs> I was gonna say you can jump in. Uh, Ken writes in. Coral bells, hands down, the best. Thanks. I I do love coral bells for the versatility of the colors and the full sun and the full shade. Uh, my favorite newest one, it's out for a couple of years, Forever Purple. And uh, it is like a, just a luxurious, rich, dark, royal purple. Uh, it's, I think it's the best of the best. Really? Eh? Even, or, even over Obsidian? Oh, oh, way over Obsidian. Really? Hands down. Obsidian that. looks so bland to me now that okay. I've seen Forever, Forever Purple. Forever Purple. Okay. I love... I, go ahead. I, I have to say, I, uh, I 
I love caramel. I just love yeah. like that. You can't get that color in anything else. And no. it's like maybe the summer, maybe one of the nine barks, but that is like, it's such a unique color <laughs> to have in, uh, in the garden. And I really, I use it. In fact, I was just to totaling up. Um, I was doing some plant estimating and stuff for some of the gardens I'm designing. And then I got to total because oh, there's like lots of little gardens all over her house. So, you know, when you're, you know, focus on one garden, but then when you add up all the plants and I was like eight caramel coral bells, I'm like on the order. I'm like, oh, that might, I might've overdone it. Like, I don't know that we need eight. <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know when you put a couple here and a couple there and a couple here you know uh, that i'm like oh, okay i might have to swap those out with some other colors so i'll definitely look at forever purple yeah and i love it with um my newest favorite hosta guacamole is definitely one of my classic ones i love the scent of the flowers and it blooms in august yes. um but rainbow's end oh the green and yellow on rainbow's end. And then you put a forever purple nearby. And right. you know, there's that classic yellow and purple. Uh, it does just stunning, just drives me wild, but oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that is great. So I'm excited that everybody's sharing their favorites and nobody has any like dilemmas or any issues with their perennials. So that's good. We're still going to talk about perennials for the next month. So we've yeah. got lots of, do we want to give them a little secret that next week we're going to talk about peonies? Um, then ground covers, I think it really, I don't want to joke, make a pun about underlooked perennials, <laughs> but you know, uh, ground covers are very, uh, uh, versatile. And, uh, so we really want people to kind of consider them as a mulch as a, you know, ground cover, that type of thing. What do you like? What are you laughing at? Oh, I was looking for my phone cause I have the notes on my phone and it oh, went dark. Okay. And I'm reading the notes you sent me. Now. Okay. <laughs> um, and ornamental grasses, they're not all created equal. No. So, um, and now is the time of year. I don't know if this is still the case. Probably not because I don't think people are returning any plants. But I know when I first started at the garden center, you know, sure enough, like beginning as soon as the garden center opened in April and May, people were bringing in their dead quote unquote dead ornamental grasses back for for replacements. Yep. And all the staff was like taking them home because they really weren't dead. They just weren't alive yet because we had they need heat right so yes that's a little secret i will try not to repeat myself again and when we talk about that again in a, in a few weeks but uh, <laughs> um and then i think uh, unique pollinator plants and attracting beneficials that's a, po a popular thing people are wanting to know which perennials to plant to attract uh, pollinators you got it so that's what you have to look forward to that's right this month that's right. That's right. And of course, we have always have extra little tips and tricks how to keep it low maintenance and all of our favorites we're going to discuss. So yeah. Um, another uh, listener, sorry, uh, Mick just wrote in. Hi, fantastic show. Allium would be my uh, first choice for perennials. Thank you. I think alliums are one of your favorites as well. They are. Yeah. I. I uh, plant and I normally don't have to get around to planting them, uh, but I did this year. So I do have, and I, uh, somebody else uh, posted, one of my Facebook friends posted a picture of another garden, like in her neighborhood. And she's like, oh, I wish I planted that many alliums, you know, like I've got them, you know, they're sporadic, but it's, you know, I think it's one of those things you can go big or go home. Yeah. They're so gorgeous when you just see like little clusters or mass plantings throughout a garden. They're just so eye catching. Yes. And I ended up having, um, I did some, having to move some things around in my garden and uh, three were in the way that I planted last fall. So I ended up cutting them and bringing them in the house and putting them in the vase and they're doing great. Yeah. They're yeah, great. So that's kind of cool flower. too. Yeah. So have, that's cool. Have you or Mick ever um, just left like the dry seed head just to sit there? Cause I, and I know people have done it too with floral paint or outside paint when they just kind of dry and they lose their color and then you just give them a spray paint and kind of turn them back to something. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, some of the garden tours I've gone to in the US that I think it's always, you know, the gardeners go through so much work to make the garden look beautiful for when we get there and then something's done flowering. So we've been in a case where there's been a few where we're like, initially when you pull up, the bus pulls up, you're like, oh my gosh, look at those alliums. And then when you get close, you realize that they did exactly that. They yeah. <laughs> And they try, but we found that it was it, it was hurt our feelings more when they painted them to try and make them look like they they were still blooming, versus oh. the, there were people who would would spray paint them like gold and silver. So then now they became art in the garden. 
you know, so I kind of lean towards, I think that's kind of fun because you're not going to fool, you shouldn't be trying to fool people, but you know, either way, I mean, it works and they, and you can do it. There are plants that you can actually do that too, right? There's not much you could spray paint else you could spray paint in the garden. I know. I can't honestly think of another one doesn't come to mind. Yeah. Yeah. So, (laughs) so that's great. Thank you, Mick. Yes. Well, so, as we wrap up, what else should we talk about? That's it. We well, we've got five more minutes. Um, you know, don't forget everyone, uh, especially if you're a new listener. Welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget you. We've got lots of past shows on your uh, favorite podcast app provider uh, to download and listen. We've got lots of different perennial talks. I think we we talked about uh, vines last year. This time last year which uh, wasn't really in the, the docket to really talk about yet this year. So we've checked out our past shows on perennial vines and, and clematises and lots of cool tips and tricks that we've got there for planting and growing and some great varieties there as well. Yeah, we should remind everybody, I know we're both so busy right now that it's hard to pay attention to our Facebook group, but we do want you to go there and, uh, and we'd love you to be part of our Facebook group. And uh, we will post past shows there when we remember. But of course, you can find all the past shows on our on our favorite podcast app. So we've done some great shows, um, and even you can look for. I will repost that this this today is our June in the Garden. You know, for the last couple of years, right. so we did kind of shake it up for 2020 because we we found the last two years, 2018 and 2019, our monthly What to Do in the Garden segments were so popular. And so helpful. We got such great feedback from everybody, and and when, and our stats. That was one of our most com- most popular shows. But we felt like we just didn't know how to do it again because uh, it was the same information. So those sh- and the benefit of that is that those shows are still there, right? That's so right. you can search June in the Garden, and uh, and this year we kind of did this different spin where instead of just focusing on the months, we focused on one topic for the month, so we could do deeper dives. That's right. You got it. So definitely reach out um, at Down the Garden Path Podcast is our handle for Facebook and our Instagram. We'd love to continue the conversation about perennials or any other questions you may or may have in your garden. Uh, we'd love to see you there and, and talk to you about that. And Joanne, what about you? Where can we find uh, you? Yes, you can find me at uh, down to earth.ca, the number two earth.ca, and uh, virtual designs as well. So I know a lot of our listeners from all over the world um, with their current state of affairs. I mean, yes, the local people, I'm still going to their yard and measuring and taking some photos and then uh, kind of working on the design and then presenting it via Zoom. But if you want to take photos and take measurements for me and, and you know, reach out. Uh, we can do the same. So definitely consider that uh, an option if you, you know, or definitely I recommend uh, finding a designer in your neighborhood. Um, so whether it's a, a, it's a garden that you're looking for, a troubled area, or whether it's a full plan, I think there's a lot of people, pools are now in high, high demand as well. And I think virtually booked for the season. And I know Melanie, we've had Melanie on and she's done a show about pool designs. She's one of our, my designer friends who primarily designs pools. She's all her designs in 2020 or for 2021. Nice. You know, so she's, uh, so that's how far ahead it might take to uh, book a, a pool design. So, uh, so yeah, so that's something that I want our listeners to know. So other, either way, I mean, check, check me out all my social media links are uh, are on uh, that site as well and like matt said are uh, down the garden path podcast on facebook and That's matt right. you are yeah you can find me at naturalaffinitydesigns.ca with all of my links to social media there as well excellent and we're excited to do this deep dive for everybody into an intro or uh, into perennials so uh like i said we're you know we're going to talk about a variety of different things but feel free, even between before next Monday, reach out, send us a message that you want to talk about or send us some photos of problem perennials or questions that you may have. Uh, we would love to help you. That's right. That's right. So I think we've reached the end of our show. We hope you guys enjoyed it. We hope you, there was lots of great information. Thank you for joining us here uh, this evening. Thank you, uh, Connie, Donna, Grace, Irene, Joanne, Joyce, Ken, and Nick. For writing in questions 
Thank you everyone for joining us here again uh, every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, yeah, we look forward to talking with you all uh, next week. That's right. And in the meantime, check out our podcast on your favorite podcast app and you can get uh, all the past episodes. That's right. So thank you for joining us here down the garden path uh, live each Monday here on Reality Radio 101. Good night. Night. Thank you for listening to Down the Garden Path with your host, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing right here on Reality Radio 101.